as I mentioned, we are uh, continuing this series on Genesis, and uh, last week we had kind of a, a fun opportunity where Ramphis, who is typically teaching in our Harris and Espanol, they're meeting in the, con- uh, in the chapel right now. We were all together, and uh, Ramphis um, continued our series last week, and it was a, a time for everybody to be together. Right now we're back to uh, kind of two locations, so uh, uh, two congregations at this location. So Espanol is meeting in the chapel right now. Um, we're also meeting uh, currently 10 a.m. At, at Harmony uh, St. Cloud in Harmony Middle School for the congregation there. And so as we walk through this series, though, um, I, uh, I hope that you've been tracking along. Uh, and um, you know, over the past couple of weeks, we've been absent like our family here. We actually had, like I said, a, an opportunity to do a family vacation and kind of hit pause on the normal rhythms and, and go and be with some extended family from Arizona and spend some time with them. Uh, and uh, I, I am reminded that you know, other families, not necessarily yours or, or mine, but vacations sometimes can cause a little bit of stress. Have you ever noticed that before? You, know, you, um, you spend a lot of time throughout the year and you kind of have these dynamics that you figure out and like what lane you run in and who does what. And, and then perhaps, maybe this isn't your family, but perhaps you know a family that when you, they go away on family vacation, it kind of upsets the balance a little bit and, uh, and you may be getting some arguments and some conflict and you're thinking, this is the time we get away for fun and, and then there's some, some problems that happen. That, that probably never happens to you, but maybe you can relate to others that, that have had that ex- experience. I'm not going to say whether that was the case for, for, for our family or not, but I have, I have run into the reality that um, if I'm not careful, like I can get even out of my own spiritual rhythms on vacation, right? And so I've had to learn, like I can't knock off having a quiet time in the morning because I'm just not a nice person to be around like a few days later when I forget to spend time with God first. I, the people that get me first instead don't get the right version of me. And so, um, so it's, a, it's an important thing that I've had to realize um, for me uh, personally. Um, but we're, um, we're in this series in, in Genesis, and we're going to look at a story today that kind of piggybacks off of the story that Ramphus preached on um, last week. Last week, we introduced the character of Abraham. And so if you noticed on the video, there was kind of two sections of Genesis that took place. Abraham's that pivotal character after Genesis 11. So starting in Genesis 12, where God moves from the story of kind of the humanity as a whole into this particular person and then people group coming from Abraham, the Jewish nation, the Hebrew people. And so Abraham's this very pivotal um, character, and Ramphus introduced that last week. Now, this week's character um, is, is part of Abraham's story. He's kind of part of Abraham's family. And they travel together and they get in some conflict together. Um, his name is, is Lot. Uh, the title of today's message is actually um, how to, uh, so is don't sin like a lot. And by that I don't mean like the valley girl thing, like a lot. Um, but his name is Lot. And we're going to see um, the reality is like Lot ends up on this downward kind of trajectory based on some decisions that he makes. And we don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. I, I don't want that for myself or, or my family as, as well. But we want you not to sin like a lot, but to sin a little differently. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. So, but the idea is, um, you can see this on the screen. If there's a big idea today, it's going to be this. It has to do with our relationship with, with sin. Because let, let me just, let me just, do a quick poll in the audience here. And actually, can I get a little more house light so I can see, um, see people and see if you're being honest with me? How many of you, like, show of hands, you've ever sinned before in your life? Okay. How many of you have sinned, like, a lot? <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm in good company here. Okay. So the reality is um, we can all, I think, relate to this, this story of Lot, but there's there's a part of his story, there's a part of the trajectory of sin in our lives that, that we have an opportunity by God's grace to do something differently. And so we don't want you to sin like, like Lot, but uh, to, that your life and the trajectory of your life would be actually different. So, um, so Lot comes up in the story of, of Abraham, as I mentioned. Um, Abraham, God blesses, God's made these huge promises to Abraham that he's going to bless him, and he's actually going to bless the nations through him, that he's going to become prosperous, that he's going to have children like the stars in the sky. And so God's making these covenantal, these long-term, these very personal promises to Abraham that fit in the story of Genesis and what he's doing. 
And then uh, as he calls Abraham out to leave and to go to a new place to follow him, we find out Abraham brings along his nephew, Lot. And so in part of their story, Lot benefits from the blessings of Abraham, like Abraham's kind of his, his business grows, so to speak. Like he ends up growing and, and developing a lot of stuff. Uh, and Lot does too. And that actually leads to some conflict. If you look at Genesis chapter 13, um, verse 5, you can read that along if you want to kind of hang out in your Bible or Bible app. We'll also put that on the screen for you. But Genesis 13, 5 says this, And Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. Like they both basically became, they got so much stuff um, that it was hard to just be in the same place together. That it created conflict. Um, it says that uh, they were, there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of, of Lot's livestock. And so the uh, Lot becomes, you, you realize this, throughout the story, a bit of a, like a family burden to Abraham. He's benefiting from the blessings in some ways, and yet he's kind of like pulling down Abraham and creating strife in another. Uh, and they come to a way to resolve that. Look at uh, verse 12. It says, Abraham, um, so they basically propose, like, where do you want to go? Um, and uh, Abraham's like, this just, this isn't working well with the two of us together. Let's do this. We're going to need more space. So I'll let you pick first. He proposes to Lot. You pick which direction in this wide open land you want to go, and then I'll go somewhere else. And so Lot chooses a direction. Uh, Abraham picks a different direction. It says Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. How is that for a great summary of the place that, that Lot moves toward? And so here we have a hint at kind of the future direction of what's going to take place in Lot's story. Like Lot has moved right next to a very dangerous place. Not necessarily dangerous. Maybe it was dangerous physically, but definitely dangerous for someone who's trying to follow God. And so he moves adjacent to that. And we're going to see through Lot's story a great like parallel of, unfortunately a great parallel of the, the way a lot of us approach sin in our lives and, and what can happen if we do sin like Lot instead of differently. So, so the first stage of this we see, we, we're going to call it flirtation with sin. Um, so if we look at Lot, the first stage in the progression of sin in his life, we, we could call flirtation. We haven't crossed the line. Like Lot actually doesn't move into Sodom. We don't know that he's doing the kinds of things that were happening in Sodom, which gives him the label that they were wicked in the eyes of the Lord. But he's right there on the line. He's going to camp out adjacent to sin uh, and, and Sodom. And, and, and maybe you can relate to this. If you've ever been a parent, um, you, you have been concerned about like proximity of people in the lives of your kids, right? Like you know there's this tendency that the, those that your kids hang out with are going to tend to do the things that those people do, right? And so you know there's a great danger of, of even flirtation to sin. But like flirtation with sin is this idea that we, could get, we can get close to sin, but just not cross the line. Uh, I spent some years as a, as a youth pastor, and this was frequently, like when we talk about sexual purity, um, this was the honest question that I get a lot of times. It's like, well, how far is too far? Like, in other words, what's the line? Like, where I cross, and then that's sin. Uh, and, and here's the thing. The question behind the question was usually, how much can I do and not get into trouble, right? Which is, which is the wrong question to ask. That's the flirtation with sin question. It's like, how far, how close? Like, if, if this is sin on, on this side, can I get, like, right up to the line and, and still be in God's graces and, and still be good? Um, that's the idea of flirt, flirtation with sin. Uh, I mentioned family vacations before. Any of you ever taken a road trip with some young kids in a car? Uh, okay. Uh, you ever experienced the, the arguments that take place in the road trip with young kids <laughs> In a car, one of those, isn't it about physical contact? I don't know, maybe your kids were like mine. It's like, they're, they're touching me. You ever get that? Well, like, you're sitting shoulder to shoulder. So help me understand, like, what, what do you mean, like, touching? Like, you're touching the whole car ride. Like, you're sitting next to somebody. Well, he's, he's touching me. Well, stop. So then you have to stop touching her or stop touching him, right? And then maybe you've been a kid like I was as a kid. And you get that, like, so then you, you're smarter and you realize, I cannot touch my sibling but I could still frustrate them without touching them. 
I mean, the overly obvious one is the, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you, right? Like, how annoying is that? You've never done that before. You're a much better person than I am, but maybe. Okay. Uh, or it's, it can be things like, I'm just going to lean over and look out your window. You ever had, so you're not, I'm not touching you, but I'm in your space, right? You ever have, you can find, I can get right up to the line of not doing the wrong thing, but still have the wrong heart, right? That there's a leaning in this question of flirtation of sin. It's the, it's the wrong leaning. When, when we're really serious about following God, what we should be asking is, what can I do to get closer to God, right? Not what can I do to get close to sin in our lives. It exposes something in our heart. There's a danger about this flirtation uh, with, with sin. When we flirt with sin, we often end up suffering consequences. Even if we're convinced we haven't crossed the line, by our flirtation with sin, sometimes we suffer consequences by being adjacent to it. This happens in Lot's story. Look at Genesis 14. Um, we're going to look at verse 11. And so we see that Lot's proximity to Sodom is going to cause problems with that. In fact, the city, we find out, is actually taken by like marauding tribes. So, so Sodom ends up being attacked by these other leaders, and, and we read about that, and um, it says this in verse 11, the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went away, and they also took Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom. Did you catch that? Something happened. It's like he was no longer just on the outskirts. He wasn't camped next to Sodom, but somewhere in that flirtation with sin, right? Like somewhere in proximity to Sodom, he had crossed the line and moved into the city. And then he gets captured with those people in the city. It says in his possessions, and they, they went their way. Uh, if you read on in the story, Abraham actually finds out about this, what happened to his nephew. He, he brings like a, a small army together of people like that uh, are in his, kind of his trained men is how it describes it. They rescue Lot and Lot's possessions and Lot moves back into to Sodom. And uh, he, he gets rescued but still stays in the same, uh, the same place. Lot's proximity to sin led to consequences. There's a, a proverb that, you may be familiar with that talks about who we relate to and who we're around and the consequences of that. It says this, that whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm, right? So there can be this flirtation with sin, even just being like that those are my people, that I hang out with unwise people, I'm going to suffer harm, we, we're reminded of in, in Proverbs. And the challenge, though, is um, that, again, the big idea of this, I said, is we, we need to think, we need to be real about the sin in your life. I want you to be real about the sin in your life. And part about being real about the sin uh, in our lives is to recognize there's a direction toward, if we're moving towards sin, we're moving in a direction. And we need to think not just about immediate consequences, but if I carry this out, what is going on? Where am I headed? What is the direction? Because here's what I know. For a lot of us, we think like, we're going to end up in a place based on just what we want. Like, what our intentions are. I, I intend to have a good marriage, or I intend to be a good parent. And, and we think our intentions determine whether we end up there. Like, that our intentions determine our destination. But it's not our intentions that determine our destination, but our direction, right? What is the direction you're headed to in your relationship to sin. And so for Lot, why, why the title is Don't Sin Like a Lot is we want you to understand that sin is not just about the moment and about the thing, but it's about a direction that's taking you toward a destination in your life. So for Lot, flirtation with sin, the direction it moves, it continues in a, in a negative direction. And what about for you? Like, are there, are there areas of sin in your life that you're flirting with? You're convinced you haven't crossed a line, but you're on the edge. There's a direction that, that has a destination that you don't want to end up in. Are you reporting sales at work in such a way that, I mean, it's not technically violating the rules, but, but you know it's not quite appropriate as well, but it makes you look better. Or married people, is there a relationship with someone of the opposite sex in your life that you've, you're not having an affair with them, but that relationship has gotten a little too friendly, a little too personal. There's, there's a line, and, and you're, you're sure you haven't crossed that line yet, but you're, you're flirting. 
with a person. You're flirting with sin. Is there something in you that you know you've got this, this tendency when it comes to work, that work can become the main thing and an all-consuming thing? And, and there's an expectation, you know, that you respond to emails and, and phone calls from home. But you, but you know there's a line in there somewhere where you're, you're putting work before your, your family and, and you wrestle with it. Am I... Am I crossing a, a line here in what God's calling me to in, in my life? Are we flirting with sin in, in areas of our lives? And maybe you think there's nothing wrong with the shows that I'm watching on Netflix, but when you stream one episode after another episode after another episode, is there a line in there somewhere where there's, there's a direction that that is taking you toward that isn't a destination that you want to end up at in your life? And so we're going to see how this plays out in Lot's story as we continue. Um, we're going to skip a few chapters later into Genesis chapter 19. And so Lot is actually going to be visited by a couple of, of messengers from God, a couple of angels um, that are coming down, and, and there's a reality that there's going to be a, a judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. And so God has sent these messengers to confirm that, that things are as bad as it, it sounds like. It feels a little bit like the story of uh, the Tower of Babel from a couple of weeks ago where God says he's going to come down and, and investigate what's happening. There's a couple of messengers that are going to investigate the, the evils of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at this in chapter 19, verses 1 to 8. It says, Two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate uh, of Sodom. What kind of implication there is Lot must be like known. Like he's not just living in Sodom now, but if he's sitting at the gate, there's a level of leadership that's, that's there. He's, he's known in Sodom. Uh, when Lot saw them, the messengers, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet and then you may rise up early and go on your way. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he, Lot, he pressed them strongly so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. Like Lot demonstrates, in this instance, Lot demonstrates great hospitality, right? And providing care for these two strangers that have shown up in the city. And we're going to see part of why Lot's concerned is I think he knows the reputation of the city and that this is not a, a wise thing for these guys to do. It's not a safe place for them to show at. And so he's inviting these strangers into his house. Look at verse 4. Um, it says this, so they uh, laid down, uh, but before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, like everybody, he's making it clear, surrounded Lot's house and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they come under the shelter of my roof. This is one of those, like, kind of what in the world moments, right, as you read the Bible. I don't know if you ever hit those. You're like, what, what the heck? Like, the, the challenge of what's happening, being presented to those two men is, is wicked and, and degraded already, and then... But then how do I take Lot's solution to that? Like, well, don't do that to them. Here's my two virgin daughters. Like, you can have instead. Like, what the heck is going on here? And, and we see with Lot the reality of he hasn't just moved in. He's not just a righteous guy living in an unrighteous place, but he's gotten warped in his own understanding of what's right and, and what's wrong as well. It seems like he does what's right, but how do you propose sending your daughters out to this, this crowd instead? And when you flirt with sin, eventually you'll rationalize sinning. The reality is that when you flirt with sin, eventually you'll, you'll rationalize sinning. What once seemed wrong to you may not seem wrong anymore. What once was obviously not a step you would take may feel like not such a big deal anymore. When we flirt with sin long enough, we tend to rationalize the sin in our life. We, we take a step in a, in a direction that's leading toward a destination that we don't want to go down, and Lot has done that in his own life. You, know, you flirt long enough with sin, and eventually you're going to cross the line. You're going to justify why that's a good decision. See, uh, flirtation is that first step. The second step is, is rationalization of sin, right? So now we've, we've crossed a line that maybe once we wouldn't have crossed, but when we do that, we can rationalize it. Um, rational 
lies. Think about it like the two words it sounds like are we tell ourselves rational lies, right? Like there are lies that we believe that seem rational to us. Think about the story of Genesis that we've been walking through. I mean, go back to the garden and Adam and and Eve with Eve's first temptation. What did the snake tell her? He told her a rational lie, (laughs) right? Like she, she knew that God said, like, I shouldn't eat of that. If I eat of the fruit of that tree, then God said, I will surely die. And And the snake tells her a rational lie. Oh, you know, like, you will not surely die, but God knows that you'll become like him. Well, that sounded good. The lie behind that, God is, God's holding out on you. That's why he doesn't want you to eat from the tree. There's something good that you'll get that he doesn't want you to have. It's a a rational lie. It's a lie. There's nothing true about it, but it's rational. It starts to sound like, well, that makes sense sense, right? And isn't that the way that sin plays out in our lives? Like we get pulled in this rationalization, like the things that we once would never do start to make sense to us, and maybe it's not such a big deal after all. We continue, um, when we flirt with, flirt with instead of flee from sin, we rationalize and we eventually compromise. You know, we can we can also rationalize like not doing the right things. Uh, there's a challenge about sin in our life. We tend to think about just the things that we shouldn't do, like the wrong things. Um, but this can play out on the, 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 what you would call the sins of omission, like what we just don't do that we should do as well, right? Like we can rationalize things about, like we, I, I know I should, um, I should serve others. Like I, we have a value at, at Harvest to, to serve God and people. We, nobody, we never say that and anyone in the room's like, that's a bad idea. I shouldn't serve people. You know, everybody nods their head and agrees, but then when it comes down to how do I serve people, like we can rationalize a lot of our way out of that. Like I, I'm just busy with work right now and, or I just have this thing and I, I know I should serve in some way, but when do I have the time to do that, right? Or, or we can rationalize other steps of faith in our lives that we maybe don't take, right? So we had a baptism service um, just a a few weeks ago, and there was a step of obedience in making public this profession of faith in Jesus. And for for some of you in your journey, like, that took a lot of time, and there was maybe, like, years of rationalizing. Well, I kind of was, like, at some point as an infant baptized, and I I, I know maybe I never did that as a a believer, but but I don't want to upset my family. And there's this real wrestle where we can kind of rationalize maybe not taking a step that God may be putting in our heart to take. We can, we can not just rationalize doing the wrong thing, but not doing the right thing in our lives. And so there's this progression. We see this in a lot, right? From flirtation with sin um, to rationalization. And the next step, um, well, the sin that we compromise in, it, it corrupts us in ways. Like it moves from rationalization to as we compromise in sin, uh, our, the image of God in us, like it's, it's corrupted in ways. Like we, sin has an effect on us. You, know, you may have heard it said that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. There's a, there's a pull of sin in our lives. There's a direction that it takes us toward that, that corrupts the image of God in us. And we can see this playing out throughout Genesis as we've been talking through this. Um, think back on the story, right? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there, there was this, this corruption of their family and what took place. I mean, just a chapter later, they have a son that kills Another son, we get to the story of the flood and how uh, humanity was described as, as so evil that God in, in grace hits reset, wiping out every family except for, for Noah's. Uh, then we have the Tower of Babel story and people who are building their own fame and their own name instead of worshiping God, right? Sin has this corrupting of what we were created to be in our lives. We can see that in uh, Lot's story as well as if we continue. Um, look at... The reality of like Lot, these, these two men, these angel, uh, angelic messengers have shown up and, and they're going to rescue Lot. But look at what takes place in that story. In verse 10, if we continue, it says the men reached out their hands. So there's this like uh, argument that's taking place, right? We caught that, what the men are trying to do. And, uh, and, and Lot proposes a very horrible solution of I'll just give you my two daughters instead. But the angels intercede. It says the men reached out their hands. They brought Lot into the house with them, and they shut the door, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the door, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping at the door. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, 
sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place. Bring them out of the place, he says. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, they're probably like betrothed to him, to their daughters, right? He tries to get them to come along to save them as well. Um, he tells them to, to come along, but they don't. Um, it says they, he seemed to them to just be jesting, like they don't take him seriously. Look at verse 15. Uh, As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and the two daughters by the hand. And catch this next phrase. The Lord being merciful to him. Do you catch how God is intent in rescuing Lot, even despite Lot's stupidity in this situation? The Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And they brought them out. One said, uh, escape for your life and do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away. And there's a little bit of dialogue back and forth and uh, drop to verse 24. It says, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire, from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him, uh, but Lot, yeah, Lot's wife behind him looked back. So as they're leaving, right, she breaks what is said to them. Don't look back, just go. She looks back, and it says, and she became a pillar of salt. There is a level of destruction from the sin. We see this in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? But also in the life of Lot's family that takes place. You see, sin takes you in a direction that you don't want to go. It started with flirtation, and it, it moved into rationalization and, and a corrupting of their, their family, but it ends in destruction. You know, the final step of sin is, is destruction. You know, God tells them, don't look back, but the pull of sin in our lives is often great, that we end up stepping right back into what God has pulled us out of. As God's rescuing them out of this city of sin, there's still a pull back to the sin that they, that they know. Proverbs says that, that there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of, of death. There's a challenge of the pull of, of sin in our life that, that we when we get into that phase of corruption, what's actually wrong feels right. And if it isn't for some intervention of God in our lives, like our next step from corruption, there's some level of destruction. And and we may just think like that's that's at the end of everything, right? There's a judgment that there is at at the end. But in our own lives, don't we, for some of you, you've you've got stories that you you can point to where you've experienced a sense of destruction that sin has caused in your life. There, There are perhaps relationships that, had gotten so badly broken that you just don't talk to that person anymore. There, there have been endings in, in your life that sin has, has caused, a level of destruction that we've stepped into in, in our lives. You know, chapter 19 even continues with just this level of destruction and corruption that's so messed up in, in Lot's family, like the even though he's rescued from this city, if you read a little further in 19, he, there is a, a just immoral level of destruction even further with Lot and his, his surviving daughters as well. And so it's real easy to like, in a way, read the story and throw Lot under the bus and like, oh, I'm glad I'm not that bad. <laughs> you know, at least that's not my story. But there's a reality that if we're honest, sin has a direction and a pull in our lives that we need by God's grace to have something interrupt that. And, and what's, what's really amazing about the story of Lot is not so much Lot's story of sin, but it's the context of Lot's story. Um, Lot and his story is actually just part of the story of Abraham and what God's doing in, in Genesis. And so we have in Lot this amazing, um, kind of like if it were an English textbook kind of word, like a foil, like a, a, an opposite of what God's doing in the life of Abraham. We kind of see Lot as the like, don't sin like a lot. Like, let's not be like that. But, but what God's doing through Abraham is he's working a salvation that all of us need uh, in our lives. 
Um, our kids have this, this phrase, uh, NPC. Anybody know what that means? If you're younger than me, if you do. NPC, for non-player character, right? Um, the reality is in Lot's story, he's kind of the NPC. He's like, that comes out of maybe like gaming terminology, like in a video game, there's like actual players in a video game, and then there's the bots that are just like computer people in the video game, right? So Lot's kind of an NPC in the story. He's not, he's a non-player character. Abraham's really kind of the character of this story that Lot takes place in. And here's, here's what's interesting if you think about it. Throughout Genesis, what we're really wrestling with up to this point is the creation and the potential that God has made in the beginning when he made everything and said it is good and, and he purposed man and woman to, to like be sovereign kings under his ruling to actually expand his kingdom throughout the earth and then sin interrupts that. Throughout Genesis, we're wrestling with this question that how, like how in the world is the kingdom of God ever gonna spread and fill the earth if we're so messed up and, and broken by sin? And so we have in the previous stories we've gone through through Genesis, these, these large acts of God where he's, he's wiped out like humanity except Noah's family and then a civilization grows again. And, and then that civilization is so corrupt he spreads them out and changes their languages. And then God is working through Abraham to pull one man apart so that he can ultimately bring one people who he can reveal himself to and he can get his plan in the beginning back on track. So here's what's interesting in Abraham's story is before this ever takes place, God's got this interaction with Abraham. Before these two messengers show up to Lot, where God knows what he's going to do, and God actually has kind of this conversation either with himself or with the messengers. I'm not entirely sure, but like, should we, we, we should let Abraham in on what's going on, right? If we're going to really use Abraham to say the way we're going to, let's warn him about the destruction that's coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then there's this amazing encounter uh, between Abraham and God about the judgment that's coming. You can see this in Genesis 18. It says, So the men turned from there and they went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you sweep away the place and, and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you, he says to God, far be it from you to do such a thing to put the righteous to death with the wicked so, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And then this goes back and forth and, and Abraham says, ah, okay, okay, okay. What if there's five less than, than 50? Like what if there are 45 righteous? And God says, if, the, if there are 45 righteous, I will spare the, the city for the sake of the 45. And he, and he keeps negotiating. Well, what if there's 30 or, or what if there's 20 or, or God, what if there's, what if there's 10? And, and Abraham has this intercession, this interaction with God where God humbles himself enough to talk to Abraham and convince Abraham that he really is the kind of God he said. Remember like last week, the story where uh, Abraham, this is coming up in his story, is going to be asked to, to kill his own son and then God intervenes. I think God is again and again revealing his character. that He is not like the kind of gods that they had thought. That he is just and he is merciful. And so all of this interaction takes place before this judgment ever happens. And here's what knowing what we know about the whole Bible, what this story of Lot and the story of Abraham should teach us is that God is always working a plan to save people. That God is always providing someone who will intercede for messed up and broken sinful people. Like the same way that, that he provided Abraham to intercede for Lot, even though Lot was being trapped by sin, that God provides someone to intercede for us. And as we we fast forward, we have a, a better Abraham that we've been celebrating as we've been singing songs. And we have Jesus, get this, Jesus. Think of the two messengers that God sent, right? He sent them to judge a city, but God knows that he's going to send not two angelic messengers, but someday his own son, not to judge a world of sinful people, but to judge sin, to judge Satan, to actually take on the penalty of sin, to die in our, our place. And so in our own journey, we have, to, we have to give God a chance to interrupt sin in our lives based on our relationship with, with Jesus. And so in a moment, we're going to actually celebrate communion together. 
And here's what I want you to do. Um, regardless of your, your story, and uh, maybe you followed Jesus for a long time, maybe you're here and, and you're kind of still figuring some of this out. Here's, here's the challenge I would love to give you. Um, when we want you to not sin, like a lot, <laughs> what we want you to do instead is to actually confess the sin in your lives. And, and one way that takes place is confession. It's, a, it's an admission between us and God about the reality of sin in our lives. Uh, the big idea I said was that we need to be real about the sin in our lives. A, a big way that we do that is that we are real about the sin in our lives is we confess it to God. When we do something wrong, we don't try to hide it from him as if somehow we didn't know, but we admit it. We bring it before him. And, and here's, here's the good news. This is the promise that God gives us in in 1 John, when he talks about what God does to, to release us from sin, it says in 1 John 1.19, if we confess our sins, he, talking about God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And here's why that can happen. Because Jesus has died already, taken the penalty already for those sins. What we need to do is confess them before God and allow him to restore our relationship again. And so I just want to encourage you to take a moment as we prepare for communion. Um, if, you, if you missed it, um, in just a minute, there's a video that's going to play. Um, there are some elements at the back of the room that you could pick up to celebrate communion together. But I want to first, I want to encourage you, take a minute, take this moment, and between you and God, just be honest with him. Are there some things that you've, you've been flirting with that you need to just say, hey, God, help me. Before I cross that line, we break the, the pull of this temptation in my life. Or maybe you've already kind of, there's this thing that's, it's already been corrupting your relationship with God and you need to confess that before him. Then let's, let's confess that. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So in a moment, we're gonna take communion together. But what I want you to do is take some time on your own and just be honest, be real between you and God about whatever you need to confess before him. And uh, there's a video that sets up the heart of confession really well that uh, may help you prepare with this time. Watch this. I have a confession to make. Grace is more racy than homosexuality, more full of life than teenage pregnancy, more captivating than pornography. Grace is far more potent than anything that can make us guilty, but we treat grace like a child when we hide our sin and question its ability. I have a confession to make. The true measure of a Christian is not how well their sin is hidden or how many church services they've attended is or how low the number of transgressions they've committed is. The true measure of a Christian is hidden in Christ whom they have been given. I have a confession to make. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and that goes for the gossip as well as the alcoholic, the greedy as well as those in adultery, the apathetic as well as the addict, the judgmental, as well as the homosexual. We're all looking for something we can throw at anyone whose sin looks worse than our own, but we're all sinners. We've all been exposed, so none of us are left with even a single stone. I have a confession to make. Anyone who calls themselves a Christian makes the ultimate confession. For Christ did not come for the healthy, but those in need of medication. The prostitutes, murderers, those in rehabilitation. So if you claim to be a Christian, you claim to be in need of powerful salvation. I have a confession to make. We are all trapped in shame until we give sin a name. For we all play this game where we try to look the same by modifying and hiding our behavior. So no one can see our sin and make us a stranger. But what we don't realize is that we are in danger. For if we act like we have no sin, we live like we need no savior. I have a confession to make. My eyes, lips, and mind are stained and unclean by words, images, and drinks that would have condemned me. But I'm not saved because I'm perfect or have my sin under control. I'm saved because I need saving, and that is the gospel. I have a confession to make. 
You no longer have to hide, for God has seen everything that you are and still came for you and died. It doesn't matter if everyone else rejects you, you're still his spotless bride. So come, make your confession and rob sin of its power. For what strength does it have if shame's been devoured? Come, make your confession and make room for the healing, both for yourself and for others whom with your very sin they too have been dealing. Come, make your confession and rid the church of its judges. For if everyone's confessing, there's no room to make judgments. I have a confession to make. God is not condemning his own, and we should not be trying to play his role. So let us start to pick up our crosses instead of our stones. Hurl rocks of gospel at each other instead of blows. Open our mouths to confess and forgive instead of keeping them closed. And overlook the speck in another's eye to attend to the plank in our own. I have a confession to make, and church, it's time you made yours too. For Christ did not die so that we may hide, but to love us in spite of the wrong that we do. So come, speak your sin on the altar of confession. It doesn't matter if the world says you're condemned, for all God will speak is salvation. celebrate communion together. Uh, and in doing that, it's, it's a reminder for us on a regular basis that the sin in our lives, it, it's so real, it's so wrong, it actually requires the death of God's own son. That sin requires death. It's the reality of part of the truth of, of the gospel. The, that's the bad news that leads to the good news. The good news part is that God so loved you, so loved the world, that rather than punishing you with death for your own sin, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And so we celebrate in communion the death of, of Christ. Not just a good teacher, not just a moral leader, but God in the flesh who died as our savior. And so uh, as we take time to celebrate communion together, we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. We eat together, remembering his sacrifice for us. On that same night, we are reminded that Jesus took a cup of wine, saying, this is my blood that is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. A new covenant in my blood, he said. Let's drink remembering God's great forgiveness and promises to us. God, I thank you that we have an opportunity for those that have already been following you for some time to be reminded again and again that your grace to us was costly to you. And so while we experience your love, while we experience forgiveness freely, that it cost you the death of your own son. And we thank you um, for your love for us that was shown in such a profound way in our lives, Lord. Now, before we close and, and sing together, I do wanna encourage you one other step to, to confession. And I think this is the unfortunately hidden or forgotten aspect of what God wants to do to free you from the sin in your lives. It's a reality of our confession of admitting and being real between us and God about the sin in our lives that, that is important. But you know, the Bible also teaches us there's a confession that goes in another direction between, between us and others, that we need someone else in our life that we can confess our sins before. In James chapter 5, 16, I want you to read that with me on the screen, but talks about the, the power of confession, not just between us and God, but between us and other believers. It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, if you think about that progression of sin, there's a reality where the thing that God most maybe needs to do in your life, the way his Holy Spirit's gonna work and free you from some of those places that you're, you're stuck in is gonna be to use someone else, uh, another trusted friend that you can 
actually let in on, on the thing that you're stuck in or that sin that is holding you in bondage. And, and while you are forgiven, sometimes you're forgiven, but you're not free. And, and you're not free because you're not bringing it into the light where someone else can, can pray for you and, and hold you accountable to that. We need to confess our sins one to another. And when is the best time to do that? As early as possible, right? If it's a sin that, it, that you're flirting on the line of sin, that's the best time to confess before someone else who can, who can give you the good advice to not cross that line. No, don't do that. They can remind you of the direction and the destination you want to head to, right? And so wherever you're at in this journey, if, if you just don't, you don't have someone in your life that you think about that, that you could actually be honest with what you're really struggling with, um, then I, I want to say, at least connect with me, um, catch me at the end of the service. I'm going to be hanging at back with some of our prayer partners at the back of the room. Um, if you're willing to be transparent with me or, or one of our prayer team, let us pray for you. Uh, this is also why we have a value as a church of establishing community that we know you need friends that are established in, in God's word who can encourage you in your faith. It's why we, we do small groups. It's why this fall we're gonna really encourage everyone that's not in one to, to get into a group, like to have the kind of friend that you can trust with that, what's really going on in your life aspect of things.